this road. It's kind of fun to drive. It all started on this quiet country road that became a crime scene in no time flat. Oh my God. Oh my God. A wild ride in a speeding 8,000 pound truck with a drunk teenager behind the wheel, playing chicken with other people's lives. Four innocent people dead. There's another child in the ditch. It was carnage, carnage and destruction. A perfect storm of wrong place, wrong time. I started screaming, where's my dad? Shattered lives and a fancy defense for a rich kid, affluenza. Too pampered for prison? Affluenza. Affluenza. It's affluenza. This is preposterous. When a teen with blood on his hands and money in his pockets didn't serve jail time. I am sickened by this judge. Up to that point, life has just told him, you can get away with it. The question on everybody's mind. Where were his parents? Tonight, they are here with their son for the first time on camera answering from the hot seat in exclusive deposition tapes. Tell us your name, please, sir. Ethan Couch. Tanya Couch. Frederick Anthony Couch. Did they shower him with everything except the word no? A case of affluenza. Good evening. It was the single word that set off a national firestorm in a case settled just last week. Affluenza, the so-called illness that a defense expert said should keep a rich teenager out of jail. Outrage not just at the teenager, but at his mother and father as well. One magazine cover actually branding them the worst parents ever. Tonight, decide for yourselves here when you hear from them under oath for the first time anywhere. Here's Matt Gutman. Take I-35, 20 miles south of Fort Worth, and you arrive in Burleson, Texas, a land of big houses and big trucks. What kind of people live here? Probably just a good average middle class, hardworking folks get up every morning, go to work. It was the night before Father's Day, and Eric Boyles was spending it with his wife, Holly, and daughter, Shelby. Shelby and, and Holly called out and said, Eric, come here. When I walked through the door, they were standing at the window to the front. Out in front of the house, a young woman driving a white SUV had spun out and was now standing by her disabled car. So the girls headed out the front door. The driver of the SUV called for help while Shelby and Holly waited with her. That same night, down the road from the Boyles house, Lucas McConnell's family was hosting a party organized by their youth pastor, Brian Jennings. He was one of the closest people that I had who wasn't family. I was around him all the time. Around 11 p.m. with the party winding down, Brian needed to return some tables and chairs to his church. Lucas and a friend jump into the back of Brian's white truck and they head down the road that would take them right past the Boyle's house. I remember we saw a car on the right hand side of the road and he decides to pull over. It was that disabled car along with Holly and Shelby Boyle's standing on the road with the driver. We're trying to get out of the car and he tells us, he's like, no, y'all just, y'all sit tight. I'll be back in just a minute. With Brian Jennings on the scene, there are now four people by the side of the road. Meanwhile, a third location, just a few houses down, there's another party in progress. But this one's not so innocent. 16-year-old Ethan Couch is there with seven friends. They're drinking, they're having a good time, and then the young woman um, needs to go to the convenience store. So they decide, well, we'll go get them. All of them? All of them decide to go. Eight teenagers load into Ethan's souped up fire engine red pickup. Six in the cab, two in the flatbed, and head on out the road. Ethan guns it, hitting nearly 70 miles an hour in seconds. His truck barreling toward the scene at the Boyles family mailbox. Chance is bringing together a crowd of people whose lives are about to violently collide. Eric Boyles is inside when his world changes forever. I felt, you know, we don't live in California, but it would almost think, you'd almost think you just had an earthquake. I mean, the house shook. When the red pickup truck packed with eight teenagers, two in the flatbed, lost control, it swerved into a ditch, sideswiped that disabled white SUV, then mowed down those four bystanders, crashing into Brian Jennings' white truck before flipping over into a tree. These photos show what remains of the Ford F-350 that Ethan turned into a weapon of mass destruction and Brian Jennings' accordion white Chevy tossed across the road. The bodies had been scattered hundreds of feet. 
At the moment of impact, Lucas McConnell was seated in the back of Brian Jennings' parked white truck. Do you remember the sound of metal crunching, of glass breaking? Glass breaking, tires screeching. The car that we were in got hit, and we got shot across the road. We nailed a tree. The back window was completely shattered. A lot of that glass was in the back of our heads. Just seconds later, Lucas's father, Kevin, part of a caravan coming back from that party, pulls up on the scene. I see tail lights up ahead. As I got a little closer, I see debris in the road. And I'm thinking, that's not a party, that's a wreck. The debris in the road that I saw was the chairs that we had been taken back to the church. And my heart just sank. I was like, oh my god. Eric Boyles is in his house when he feels the explosion, rushes out the front door to where he left his wife and daughter. He starts dialing the phone. I was on the phone with 911. Lieutenant County 911, what is your emergency? Uh, there's a multi car accident out in front of my house. While Eric's on with 911, half a dozen other frantic calls come in. There's four or five kids, there's kids laying in ditches and streets. Are you with the accident right now? Oh, Lord, oh, yes, there's another child in the ditch. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We've got one laying on the road unconscious. They say he's breathing. There were already people out there in front of the house. It was just debris everywhere. There were table and chairs and car parts and everything else. I walked in the road, and the first thing I did was I found there was a, there was a male laying in the road, wasn't moving at all. Between the four people dead in the street and the 10 injured in the vehicles, the casualty count is staggering. It was chaos. There were people lying around, injured, hurt, dead, people yelling, screaming, help me. Eric Boyles was yelling for his wife Holly and daughter Shelby. I'm calling out Holly and Shelby as I walk, and I kind of got halfway between the road and my fence. And that's when I found Holly. And when I found her, I mean, there was no doubt that that she was gone. And then it was a matter of, OK, so where's Shelby? As Eric stumbles along, searching for his daughter, about 20 feet down the road, he sees a young woman, her body thrown up against the fence. Everything told me this should be Shelby. It didn't look like Shelby. And I'm sitting there trying to process the amount of trauma the bodies went through and, and what would the impact be and, and what would that do to you? At the same time, on that same dark road, Kevin McConnell is also searching for his friend, youth pastor Brian Jennings. On the other side of the road, I see Brian laying in the ditch. I ran over there. So you're on the ground to tend to Brian and suddenly hear what you think is the voice of your son yes. in the truck. I just heard his voice, and it was just at that moment that I realized that Lucas had been in that truck with Brian. And right as we got out, we realized that it wasn't just us. There was people everywhere, and then we saw Brian. I tried to feel for a pulse. I didn't feel a pulse. And I pull out my phone. I'm calling 911. Sir, how many people are injured? Do you know? Uh, one, two, three, multiple. Multiple? I don't even know how many. My dad said, just hold this fence right here and just pray. You can hear Lucas's terrified voice in the background on that call. Brian, I need you to sit here and I need you to pray, OK? Oh, my god. Come here. I need you to sit here and I need you guys to pray, OK? Do you remember what you were praying for? Brian's safety. About that time is when the other cars from the party started getting there. Brian's wife, Shauna, arrives on this hellish scene. It was a normal drive, and then all of a sudden I saw teenagers walking down the side of the road. And my first thought was, why do people let their teenagers walk down the side of the road? It's like almost midnight. Shauna pulls over and realizes there's been a crash and her husband was involved. I really thought, OK, he got hit, but he's going to be OK. And I'm thinking, God wouldn't do that to me. But her faith is tested by what she finds farther down the road. I saw him, and I knew that it wasn't good because I could see that Kevin was um, doing CPR. And by now, Shauna's three children are also on the scene. I was just crying out to God. I was like, please save my dad. I need him. You can't take him yet. I'm not ready. The first EMT or firefighters that got there, they were just so overwhelmed. They would just walk down the road and, is he conscious? Are they conscious? Are they conscious? The scene was 
as bad, if not worse, than anything I've seen. And that's 35 years of law enforcement, because it was a huge crime scene, spread over hundreds and hundreds of yards. Tonight, we're hearing the chaos in the moments after a truck full of teens slammed into three cars, killing three good Samaritans and a woman with a flat tire. The chain reaction crash happened late Saturday night. It's almost like watching a movie. It's like it's not happening to you, and it's just surreal, and it's not, it's not real life, <laughs> but it was.